thank you for having me here. It's my first time here in Krakow, my first time in Poland. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. We have a very beautiful city. We walked around last night, drank a little vodka with grass in it. Okay, sure. I'm going to stand down here with you. Is that okay? I tend to move around a bit. Um, like a few of my colleagues, I have been accused a number of times in my career of focusing way too much on one area of the brain, the amygdala, and ignoring everything else. I don't really know where this comes from. I don't think it's very fair. I don't see why people think this, but perhaps there's something to it. I feel like I've branched out in the last few years. I feel like I've tried to include this definitely not amygdala area. Nobody seems to be listening. So I was trying to think of a way that I could argue against this point that I'm overly focused. And I ran into this website called wordle.net. Have you been there? I was walking by one of my students' uh, monitors, and that was up on the screen. And I said, what the heck is that? And she said, that's my, that's my thesis. It's my dissertation. And I said, I don't understand. She said, well, you can take the whole Word document and copy it and dump it into this website called wordle.net and it'll spit out what it calls a word cloud. The size of the word is the frequency of the word in the manuscript. So social must have been the word that occurred the most in her manuscript. She was a sociology major. She did a study about violence in Kenya. So I thought, this is it. This is perfect. I'll take the last chapter I wrote, dump it into wordle.net. They'll all see. They'll see I've moved on. I've branched out. Not so much, turns out. So at least you know my bias now heading in, right? I actually recommend that you do this because you learn a lot about yourself. Like uh, maybe you're citing yourself a little too much here. And uh, that's, that's sad enough, except when I tell you that, um, you know, here's the size of Ledoux and Phelps. Um, <laughs> apparently, I need to look at my influences a little more carefully. All right, I'm going to start. Uh, we're going to talk about your implicit reactions to facial expressions, automatic reactions, compared to your explicit reactions to facial expressions. And I'm going to use a motor example just to get us started. This gentleman, the left side of his face is paralyzed. If you ask him to smile voluntarily, he tries, but he can't move the left side of his face. So the only part that moves is the right side. So he must have a lesion somewhere in the motor cortex over here that can't move the muscles over here. But if somebody cracks a hilarious joke, He's cured. That is, there must be another motor center in his brain that quite spontaneously, because you, you don't get to decide if a joke is funny or not, can move these muscles implicitly. And so we know that that area of the brain is called the striatum. You, should, you know that when you overlearn a motor program, you transfer that information and that knowledge, if you will, to this motor system. So remember your driving test? When you first start driving a car, it's very explicit, very effortful. And how do you drive now? Right? You don't have to pay as much attention. Every now and then you come back to us, right? Who's been driving the car for the last nine minutes, right? And you have this vague recollection of a left and a vague recollection of a right. But you weren't explicitly there. You've automated that. So all I'm asking you to consider today then is something that's not much more radical than that, and that is the amygdala. Emotional learning in your life is so practiced, so important, that you can do that implicitly as well. Okay? And we'll, we'll see that this system can react implicitly on its own, I think, and it can be dragged in by these explicit systems. Right? So you have two routes to getting this system going. Well, I started my research not with human beings and facial expressions, but with rabbits. So what Joe Ledoux does to rats, just for fun, I do to rabbits. Um, you have same thing, right? CS plus, CS minus, you have a tone that the animal learns, predicts an aversive outcome. The tone doesn't come on until right here, and it's on for five seconds, and the animal receives a mild shock to his ear. And you can see that this neuron, by the way, every, so every big spike here, that's an action potential. So you can see for this neuron, it wasn't doing much for five seconds. But when that tone came on, it's very aware of what that tone is predicting. And you can prove that to yourself by having another tone that sounds a little different. And this neuron will discriminate between the tone that predicts shock because nothing happens to the animal here, right? So that's differential uh, Pavlovian conditioning. Well, 
Once we start with human subjects, move from rabbits and brain scanners, we have to think about what are we going to do to you when we put you in the scanner. Now Liz just gave you a wonderful presentation of how somebody who wants to collaborate with Joe and see if we, how much of the stuff that's true in rats is true in humans and you find out amazingly it's, there's a lot of similarities, there's a lot of important differences, but there's some amazing similarities which might surprise you. And so what I thought is that's important work and somebody's going to be doing that, but I, instead of training you up with tones and shocks while you're in the scanner, maybe I can show you things that you already respect, you already have learned quite a bit about. And so we show you faces. I show you faces because your brain loves faces. Your brain sees faces when there aren't any faces to see. That's how much you love faces. I show you faces because, as James just laid out very nicely, uh, there are important messages that get communicated to you on faces. These are conditioned stimuli. This has predicted outcomes for you in the past. Okay? We all have a different reinforcement history with this expression, but it's similar enough that we should be able to see some similarities when I present that to you in a brain scanner. And I can probably only do this with human subjects because we all know animals don't have facial expressions, right? Okay. Turns out you're not the only one that uses the faces of others to predict outcomes. If you take a bunch of sheep and put them in a room and show them this picture versus this picture, all their little hearts start going crazy when they see this picture, okay? So even sheep can use the faces of other sheep to predict what's going to happen next. All right. So if you're interested in amygdala, and we already know from the animal work that the amygdala is involved in learning about predictors of negative outcomes. That's really its job. Okay? If a bear is two inches from your face, your amygdala is going to be going nuts. Okay? But it's not going to be able to do much for you. Better you had learned yesterday what a snap of a twig 200 yards behind you meant and then you might not have a bear two inches from your face. That's why you have an amygdala, okay? So what we did uh, is throw people in scanners and show them fear faces because we knew about this patient group where you have human beings who have calcification of their amygdala, right? It's called urbach vitat syndrome. The rest of their brain is intact, but their amygdala is compromised. And when people like James Russell and scientists like that took the Ekman faces and showed them to these patients, they had trouble processing fearful faces, more so than any of the other expressions. And so, for those of us trying to decide what's going to happen with normal subjects in a brain scanner, those data said to us, put normal individuals in a brain scanner and show them fear faces, and the amygdala should be very sensitive to their presence compared to any other facial expression. And those studies work um, beautifully, and they've seen, that finding is seen no matter what laboratory you, you look at, no matter what expressions you compare it to. Amygdala always seems much more interested in fearful expressions than any of the other expressions. Well, that's a nice finding and a good start, but I told you that I want to try to convince you that this can be an implicit system, but you're a human subject. You do something when you're in a brain scanner that's a little different than what my rabbits do. You try to figure out my experiment, and then you run up and tell me about it when you come out, right? I didn't ask you. Come running up to me. I know what you're doing. You show me negative faces, positive faces, and blah, 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 blah. And the problem with that I'm very, I'm very proud of you. The problem with it is you're making this very explicit. That means you could have been lying on your back saying those things to yourself when I was showing you the faces. And I want this to be implicit. I want to show you that amygdala can do this without your, without your permission. Well, the way you do that is you show your subjects the same thing you showed them before. You show them fearful faces, and I didn't tell you about the comparison condition for a lot of these is happy faces, or we can use neutral faces. And you, you show the face, and you just, what you do is you just show it for a, a much shorter period of time. In our initial studies, it's 33 milliseconds. Now we have it down to 17. And that's not the magic part. If I a face for 17 milliseconds, you'll kind of see something. Um, but if I follow it immediately with a neutral face of another individual, then when that event happens, what you report subjectively that you saw is her. And you don't talk to me anymore about having seen afraid faces. So this is called backward masking. And you, it's the same experiment, it's just now what you're going to think you've seen is a whole bunch of neutral faces, but what you've really seen is a whole bunch of neutral faces, half of which have been preceded by fear, and half of which have been preceded by neutral. When I ask you now what you think my study is about, 
you tell me you're not so sure of yourself anymore, and you tell me, well, there were males and females, and they were black and white. And the human brain is wonderful. You're always going to try to make sense of your experiences. So you say, everybody's got a story. Uh, I think there was a pattern. It went like four females, and then two males, and then four females. But nobody's talking to me about emotional expression. But when we check the brain, the amygdala is picking up on the masked fearful faces compared to the masked happy faces. So it is implicit. This is going on automatically. And you, this is a dark slide, but what I'm trying to impress upon you, here's that amygdala slice right here. And here's amygdala here, where you're getting activation to mass fear versus mass happy, and you don't see a heck of a lot throughout the rest of the brain. So this seems like a, a rather isolated ability um, for this area of the brain. Well, once you have an effect like that, the first thing you could a should ask yourself is how can amygdala be pulling that off? Because that's a heck of a lot of information. And so we thought the same thing. And we thought that it probably wasn't computing all of that. When, people, when, when you scan a face, when you look at a face, you don't do it randomly, right? First place you go is to the eye region. That's what we all do. You get more information from some parts of the face than other parts of the face. And I'm using backward masking, so you're not going to see it anyway. So I can take advantage of that, and I can run a study that looks like this. Do you see what my career has been? It's the exact same experiment, just changing one tiny thing. And here, we're just going to remove everything on the face pictures except the size of the eye whites, just the sclera. And so we have fearful eye whites that are masked and happy eye whites that are masked. It's the same thing. Again, it's very important. You're not going to see this. This is a weird, distorted stimulus. If I, if I show you eyes floating in space like this, you might start talking to me about Scooby-Doo cartoons and God knows what else, right? And those are competing cognitions, and I don't want any of that. I sidestep all of that with the backward masking. Again, you think you've seen a bunch of neutral faces, but you've actually seen a, uh, half have been preceded by fearful eye whites. And when you run that, you get amygdala picking up on the eye whites. So even when I showed you entire fear faces, amygdala was probably just computing a contrast here of the size of the sclera for fearful faces compared to the other faces. And there's a nice 3D um, version of that finding. Well, that's nice and that's gratifying. You know, I know, I'm pretty sure you know how this works, right? Whenever you come up with a piece of data that you think should be shared with the rest of the field. What happens is journals send that data out to three of your peers, and they anonymously decide if this is up to snuff, if this should be, right? Um, if this should be, should be in, and if people care about science um, and, and uh, what should be in and what should be out, then that process works uh, really well. What's interesting is all, I got some pretty good reviews for this, but all three reviewers said something that I hadn't thought of, frankly. They said, this is a wonderful example of an evolutionarily conserved rule. And I thought, huh, well, that's not why I ran that study. Um, I'm a psychologist. I tend to just lean on the side of learning. And that learning, I'm sure you do come into the world with lots of important, hardwired, innate things. But that learning probably trumps a lot of that. And so whether this is innate or not is interesting, but because you get it in a backward masking paradigm doesn't necessitate that that's, that's the case. As far as evolution goes, I'm a fan, don't get me wrong. If this is an evolutionarily conserved rule, it's just interesting to think about the fact that it's going to be a relatively new one because humans have light-colored sclera. Apparently, it's very important for us to know where each other are looking. So you have a light sclera, so you can track that. The monkey world actually is a world where you're better served by a dark sclera. Monkey worlds are filled with dominance hierarchies and alpha males and subordinates. If you want to have a really bad day and you're a subordinate monkey, get caught showing direct eye contact to an alpha male. If you survive that day, it, it will not be without injury. So in the monkey world, it's actually more adaptive for other monkeys to not know where you're looking, right? So that's just interesting to think about. So we have rules. The amygdala has rules. It likes fear. Well, it's not really fear faces, it's fearful eyes. It's not so much fearful eyes as it is the widening of the sclera. Okay? Well, how low can you go? What other subtle things can be happening on a face that amygdala could be tracking implicitly? So if you were a subject in my study, you would be passively lying on your back watching faces like this go by. Then what I do is I hand you a piece of paper, and on the piece of paper would be a list of all the face parts. It would say forehead and eyebrows and eyes and iris and sclera and pupil and nose and nostrils and 
teeth and lips and chin and cheeks and the whole thing. And I would just say to you, you know, while you were watching those pictures go by, just if you noticed anything about the face parts, write it down now. Okay? So when I do that with a group of subjects who've seen about 100 of these faces, uh, this is what a lot of you write. Okay? Turns out, here's another way you're different than rabbits. <clears throat> you're not very nice, it turns out. You pick on each other. Now, this may not have been random because I have to admit, um, we didn't think about it at the time, but we did get these pictures from one of those hair cutting books, as in you too could have this hairdo if you want it. Okay? So that might have been a nice distraction. So then we said, no, 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 okay, that's fine. We actually photoshopped something on every picture. We've manipulated something on the face. Right? And so we said, now go ahead and, and take a guess. And people are guessing randomly, and nobody's picking up on the fact that actually pupil size is systematically varying with each picture. Now, these pictures are too dark and too far away from you for you to have picked up on that here. But in a scanner, uh, you would be close enough to these and they would be resolute enough that you could be, you're proximal enough to pick up on pupil size differences. So that, and they're coming one by one. Every picture has a big pupil version and a small pupil version. And again, I'm sure you can't see that. What's important is you're only seeing the pictures <clears throat> one by one, and you only get to see one version. If you're a subject in this study, you'll only see her big version or her small version. And we'll counterbalance that across subjects. Okay? So there's no way you can explicitly pick up on the fact that this is changing over time. But amygdala does. Amygdala is much more interested in big pupils. Than it, is with small, than it is small pupils. Now, why would that be? What's pupil dilation mean? Well, if you stimulate the amygdala in an animal or in a human, you get pupil dilation. You get eye widening, too. Apparently, amygdala is being sensitive to responses in other people that it controls in you. If somebody's just dilated their pupils or widened their eyes, they're interested in something in their immediate environment. They've detected something. They're learning. If you're close enough to have picked up on that, you're in their environment, too. You should be learning, too. So amygdala is going to be very sensitive to a signal like that in another person. Now, you might know, have noticed that all the pictures we used are females. All the subjects then were males. We did that on purpose because pupil dilation is also associated with something else in the literature. Anybody? Arousal slash attractiveness, right? So a number of studies, not all, find that people will rate pictures with larger pupils as more attractive. And so we had to think about that because someone could then suggest here that amygdala is actually tracking attractiveness and not this whole arousal message, interest message, learning message communicated by the pupil. So we took um, attractiveness ratings of these faces and in this study, we did not find in a relationship between pupil size of the picture and, and the attractiveness ratings. So uh, the, the literature is about 50-50 on this. Uh, it's an interesting issue. We can talk more about later if you want. Um, you know where that comes from, right? Attractiveness in pupil dilation. In the Victorian era, women used to put something in their eyes called belladonna to dilate their pupils. We all know this story. If they're going to the ball that evening, there's going to be suitors at the ball. If you dilate your pupils, you're more beautiful. You'll be married by morning. Get it? Of course, if you've ever had the eye drops at the eye doctor and had your pupils dilated, do you know something else, right? You can't see anything. So if you've seen pictures from the Victorian era, often, ugly guy standing with a very beautiful woman. I think we have an explanation for that now. OK, the joke's not going to get any better than that, I promise you. <laughs> All right, so now we, have, we can add pupil dilation to our list of crude rules. I get that word crude from Joe. Amygdala should be interested in crude representations of the things that are out there. Very, things, very crude s signals that pr communicate very co complex predictions or what the rest of the brain can then take and figure out is a very complex prediction. But here we can keep it very simple, okay? Now that more general idea that we have an implicit life and automatic emotions can move us around comes from um, a very famous uh, social psychologist, um, uh, Robert Zients, and a, me a member of the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. And so you, I'm sure you know, his whole thing was about presenting pictures to you that he hoped you had never seen before in your life. And presenting them in a way that either you wouldn't remember them, so he'll present a thousand of them, or that you wouldn't have seen them consciously, so he'll do it subliminally. 
Either way, he'll then show you those pictures again and then a whole bunch of other pictures. And you will like these ones better, even though you will not remember seeing them before or not have been aware that you saw them before. So that's called the mere exposure effect, right? So that is uh, a way of thinking that's had a huge impact on this whole idea of thinking about your implicit life in parallel with your explicit emotional life. Well, let's think about this now. I told you we went after the fear effect because of these patients that had trouble processing fearful faces. Why is amygdala interested in fear more than all the other expressions? I mean, a really good comparison would be that expression. If amygdala is monitoring the environment on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to pick up on predictors of bad outcomes for you, I would think that would be involved too. Well, it turns out amygdala is responsive to angry faces, but not as much as to fear. So you have to have an explanation for that. And so our explanation for it um, depends on us talking about now, instead of treating the amygdala as one unitary structure, trying to break it down a little bit. Now, we've talked about in the human, that's going to be very difficult. In brain imaging, using blood oxygenation, blood flow responses, it will be very difficult to talk about central nucleus versus lateral nucleus. But we might be able to cut it in half and maybe make predictions about what one half might be doing versus the other. If I draw on top of the human amygdala here now, it looks a little bit different. It's oriented a little bit differently than the rat one we looked at last night with, in Joe's presentation. Okay, that, if the lateral nucleus is here in the human, it ends up being very lateral and very ventral. And you may remember from Joe's talk, this whole thing is rotated over to, around to the left so that the lateral nucleus it, it can be, is rather dorsal here. But that's not the case in the human. When you're looking at the ventral amygdala in the human, 10 millimeters below the anterior commissure, you've got the lateral nucleus and those basal nuclei. You've got the basal lateral amygdala, very unambiguously. That means then that central nucleus is up here dorsally. So if you have a line here, you can try to separate areas of the brain where central is located from areas of the brain where you know that's more amygdala proper, more basal lateral. The problem with doing that, and I'm not sure you can see it on this slide, is the central nucleus is, is a nucleus. It is compact here, but those neurons are found throughout the ventral basal forebrain here. So I have a bunch of green dots here. You may also be able to see a, a red compactus nucleus here. That's the nucleus basalis. That's one of your neuromodulatory systems. That's the primary source of acetylcholine for your entire cortex. Acetylcholine can affect response thresholds in all cortical neurons, especially your sensory cortical neurons. If basalis speaks and uh, it will globally and instantaneously change the amount of acetylcholine available to cortical neurons. A visual neuron might now see something it wouldn't have seen a second ago. An auditory neuron might now hear something it would have missed a second ago. You're more vigilant. You're going to be better at learning. This system, central nucleus, we know it goes down to the brainstem and does all that good autonomic stuff. Heart rate changes. Motor reflex changes. But it also goes to these neuromodulatory systems and makes the brain a better consumer of information. If amygdala is not sure about what it's dealing with, this is how it asks for help from the rest of the brain. This is how it makes you more vigilant. So I'm, I've got that now drawn in a, a, a brighter slide. Here's your ventral amygdala. Here's your central nucleus. And then in green, I've colored the, these are called extended amygdala neurons, and they come out through the ventral basal forebrain. They congregate into another nucleus, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. Uh, and then basalis is here in black, sitting right on top of all of this. So when you get a brain activation here, you can't, I can't tell you that it's central, or extended amygdala, or basalis. But I don't think I really need to, because when you record from this area of the brain, which is what I did for too long, in rabbits, and whether you've got a basalis cell or a central nucleus cell, you see a very similar picture. This is a neuron right here. Each one of these ticks is an action potential. This is EEG up at the cortex. This is how activated you are. You may know from EEG when the waves are big and slow like this, you're not very aroused, you're not very activated. You're kind of just hanging out and relaxing. But when the waves get small and desynchronized like this, you're very active. Okay, so you can see that this neuron is ticking along here. We're playing a tone here that's predicting shock. And you can see that this neuron is, is interested in the tone, but it's created a state change in the animal that persists, the neuron stays up, the cortex stays activated. Here we are a minute and 15 seconds later. The, the neuron is up, the cortex is activated, but look, as the neuron comes back 
down to earth, so goes the cortex. Well, that's what happens in a conditioned animal where you're playing tones that predict shock. But you can take experimentally naive animals and see the same exact thing. This relationship exists every moment. Fear is a compartment. It's a very important extreme compartment. But you live on the continuum. Uh, these are extreme examples of emotion. They happen. They're important. But your, most of your emotional life is spent right here. You're fluctuating right now. And this system has, has a, a hold of that gain. Okay? So this can influence whatever your cortex is learning on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And that's what you, you would think is happening if you see an activation in that dorsal part of the amygdala. Because we can't separate this system, but they're all working together. The central nucleus goes directly to basalis, which affects acetylcholine throughout the cortex. So, we thought one way to think about that and think about amygdala's interest in fear versus anger was to, was to run studies where we direct, directly compare them. And we've, we're thinking about Joe's model where important predictors are detected by the lateral nucleus. Fear is important, anger is important. They both predict an, an increased probability of threat. This system's gonna be equally interested in them. Joe told you last night, there are outputs at the level of this system where behavior can be enacted if that's the way the system wants to go. If what's predicted here is clear, then you might do that. But if you're not sure yet what you're dealing with, you might go up to Central and Bezalis and ask for some help. When you run into an angry face, you know two things. Threat is increased, and you know the source of threat, that guy. When you run into a fearful face, you only know one thing. The probability of threat is increased. You still have to learn and figure out contextually what the problem is. And that contrived setup then Ventral amygdala will be equally interested in these as the, for the increased probability of predicted threat. But when we do an fMRI study doing fear minus anger, we should only see activation of this dorsal system to, to fear because that's uncertain threat versus certain threat. We draw our line 10 millimeters below the anterior commissure. If you show fear faces or angry faces, you get a similar response in the ventral amygdala. They're both negative. They're both predicting an increased probability of threat. But when you do fear minus anger, you only see the dorsal amygdala because that's uncertain threat versus certain threat. The rest of the brain is being asked for help here, more so than by this system yet, is the argument. Well, the reason God invented graduate students is so that they could you know, be a little bit more skeptical about your ideas than maybe you're being. And so what Caroline said to me was, you know, it's really nice the lights going on and off the way you're predicting, but it would be really nice if this uncertain versus certain threat had some impact for the organism. That is, you might want to measure some behavior that would change according to these rules. So what Caroline did is she took a paradigm that's tried and true. This is the dot probe paradigm. This is a classic emotional attentional task. And what you do is you throw two faces up at the same time. One of them in the classic version of the task is angry. The other one's neutral. What's going to happen is when these two come up, this will attract your attention. They disappear, and a dot is behind one of the faces. You have to tell me whether the dot is on the left or the right. It can be either behind the angry face, or it can be behind the neutral face. It won't surprise you to find out you are faster to detect this dot behind the angry face than you are to detect it behind the neutral face. It makes perfect sense, right? Well, now thinking about what we just argued about fearful faces pointing you to the context, What's going to happen when we put fear in this type of paradigm? Most everyone else would predict it's negative, it's arousing, it's more interesting. You're going to go here, you're going to get the same exact effect. But we would suggest that what the message when you get here is very different. I'm not your problem. Actually, anything around me is your problem. So we, we were predicting that fear faces should diffuse attention, not focus it. And you shouldn't see an advantage for fearful faces. So you run that in a paradigm that looks like that. And what you do first is you replicate what everybody else already knows, your faster reaction times to angry faces versus neutral. And then what you show is that fearful faces give you that same advantage, but they don't create a bias. They facilitate responding to anything in the experimental context. Okay? The neutral face and the fear condition is the key. We have one more condition in the study, two neutral faces where you shouldn't have a bias. Now I can compare neutral faces when fear was on the screen 
to neutral faces when angry was on the screen, to neutral faces when neutral faces are on the screen. And importantly, you are fastest to neutral faces when fear is on the screen. Fear pushes you and diffuses your attention for anything, so you're ready. It widens the net instead of focusing you. Well, Caroline had an idea for a second study. If that's true, if attention moves you to the context when you see fear faces, then if I stick stuff in the context, you should have better memory for it. You should learn about it better. So we could have stuck anything in the context, and what we decided to stick was neutral words. So this is going to be a memory test. So write down as many words as you can remember. What's going to happen is you're going to see them in blocks where they're alternating with fearful faces. So the context here is temporal, right? But that's context as well. And we'll compare that to neutral words that are all around neutral faces. Now, when you come out of the, uh, come, when you get done looking at the computer monitor, this is a behavioral study. We're just going to say, write down everything, all the words you can remember. And we're predicting you'll remember more of these words than these words because these faces pushed you out to the context. So you run that and it works, right? The problem there, though, is you could argue with me, okay, well, that's just because fear jacks you up. It's just a basic arousal effect. It doesn't have anything to do with diffusion of attention. So what I need is another facial expression that's equally arousing and equally negative. That's anger. So you run the same thing and just change these to angry faces. If, fear, if there's something special about fear, you shouldn't be remembering more words from these blogs. And that's what you find. Okay? Anger doesn't produce that same sort of thing. They're both equally arousing, they're both negative, but they sent, there's a very different message once you get there. Well, we ran that and we realized there was one question we forgot to ask the subjects. We asked them about the words, but we could have asked them about the faces. If we're, what we're suggesting is that fear sends you out and anger sucks you in, then actually you should remember more words from the fear condition, but more face identities from the anger condition. So you set that up, now you need different faces counterbalanced between angry and fear, you pit them directly against each other. It's still gonna be how many words can you write down, but what we'll predict is you're gonna remember more words from this condition and more of their individual faces from that condition. And so that's exactly what you find. Better memory for words in the fear condition and better memory for faces in the anger condition. So, Negative valence is, is key, as James was pointing out. But these, these systems, once that's detected, can do very different things with them depending on the information value. So anger directs you in while fear sends you outward. Well, this is the game I like to play. I like to play taking a facial expression I think I know a little bit about and pitting it directly against another facial expression. If the widened eyes are all about you not knowing what's causing that expression and that there's something separate from its negativity, then, then a really good comparison would be another facial expression where I have widened eyes that tell me something is happening in the environment that I don't know what it is, but it's not necessarily negative. That's a surprise, right? Is a car coming at her or did she just walk in on her birthday party? You have, to, you have, to, you have one more thing you've got to figure out with this one. But you still have the same source problem. You have widened eyes. She knows something you don't know that you have to learn. Well, when you do that in a brain scanner, you get something very fun. If you look at that face and you tell me, that's not, that's not the face I want you to look at. You look at this face and you tell me it's negative. Then what you show me, and it won't surprise you, is you show me a big signal in the amygdala correlated with how negative you think that face is. But if you look at that face and you think it's predicting something positive, you show me a large signal uh, in the prefrontal cortex that I don't see when you tell me it's negative and, that, and a correlated lower signal in the amygdala, okay? You're regulating. And what's critical here is that this is implicit. These ratings are not being taken online. You are lying on your back passively watching surprised faces, then I ask you a half an hour later what you think of them. What you did unconstrained lying on your back here predicts what you say a half an hour later. This valence calculation and I think James's two-year-old data fit well with this. This is one of the most fundamental questions your brain asks of anything in front of it, good or bad. Okay? And, and this doesn't necessarily have to be an explicit conversation. It can be, but it, it probably usually isn't. So my graduate student, Maytel, um, has pretty much run with this paradigm. The way she runs it now, she runs it as a binary, two buttons, positive or negative. I'll show you one face, you have to tell me, you have to pick. So we have faces that we think we know what you're going to say. Angry, you'll push negative. 
positive, you'll push, um, happy, you'll push positive. And when we show you surprise, then we want to know. If I show you 100 of these, all different people, how many times are you going to push that negative button? And so I can graph you. If you're up here, you're, you're pushing the negative button a lot. If you're down here, you're pushing the happy button a lot. Run a bunch of people. They're all on top of each other in agreement that angry faces are negative. Same people are in agreement that happy faces are positive. What do those same people do with the surprise faces? They spread themselves out, right? There's a good number of you who are quite sure that most of the time these are predicting a negative event. Others of you are quite sure that most of the time these are predicting a positive event. And then you have a group that's kind of interesting we didn't think about when we first designed it. You have your fence sitters there in the middle, 50-50, maybe seeing both sides of the coin and being very content there. Maybe they're the most flexible at all, right? This only becomes important when we can predict something about you from what you say. So it's a relatively new measure for us, so we'll see if this is such a bad thing to say. Is it such a good thing to be so rosy? Uh, down here and always uh, seeing things so positively? Or maybe the best answer is here in the middle, where you're flexible and you can see both sides. So we shall see about that. Um, I can tell you that this is not the mood you're in the day I studied you. So you wonder if this is state or trait. Okay? We have you come back in a year, and what you said at year one, what you said at time one, it correlates uh, very strongly with what you say at time two. There's an extreme score here, but the, it, it holds uh, without it. So this look, looks like something more trait-like. So we think this is something about your positivity and negativity bias. And what we want to know is, that, does it increase your risk for things like anxiety and depression? Um, one more point about this. When I'm taking these ratings, I can measure your reaction times. It takes you less than a second to tell me anger is negative. It takes you less than a second to tell me happy is positive. How long does it tell you, take you to tell me surprise is whatever you tell me? It takes you longer. So you are choosing. See, if you're one of the pessimists, you might argue with me that surprise doesn't have two valences. If I'm a pessimist and I look at surprise, it's negative. It's very clearly negative to me. That's actually not true. Even when you're picking negative, you're taking longer than anger. So you are making a choice still. You're choosing negativity or positivity. And I can make that point even clearer by separating out reaction times when you say positive from reaction times when you say negative. It takes you the longest to decide something's positive. Optimism takes more effort. It takes more time. You have another layer of prefrontal regulation you have to bring to bear, right? You have this default system. Your whole brain's not a pessimist. You're not a pessimist. But there is a circuit that's probably there to protect you. That is. And you've got to counter that, OK? Well, the expressions are fun, and you can, when I leave, it up to, leave you up to your own devices to decide if we, I can, you, you now know you sit there with a bias as to whether that's negative or positive, and I can measure it. But I can also move you around explicitly. I can proceed the face with a sentence that says she just lost $500, and you will go the negative route. You'll be low prefrontal, high amygdala. And I can g give you a sentence that said he just found $500, and I can send you the other way. Okay? So I can move you around despite your bias. And this is a nice strategy. It's tough to do this work because you have to be able to separate a blood flow response from the sentence to the word. But if you jitter these things carefully and look, at, look carefully at the waveform, uh, you can do it. Um, that's important because we don't have to look at expression necessarily. That's important. But before we even get to expression, you, you're important. That is, we have to learn about each other. So, is the system that is implicitly responding to eye widening and implicitly making valence calculations about these surprise faces, is that the same system that gets dragged in when you have experiences with people, a reinforcement history with a certain individual, and they now predict good, good outcomes for you or bad outcomes for you? And that's important because um, not everybody in this world is nice, right? Some people are kind of mean, and other people are very nice, and still other people are kind of boring, frankly. Um, and they don't, really, they, don't, they don't impact your life that much. So we have an RA typing in the color of your clothing as you're coming in. And then this woman will always predict relevant but neutral statements. This woman will always compliment you. She's going to tell you you're pretty. She'll tell you you're interesting. She'll tell you you're smart. This woman uh, is going to tell you you're ugly and you're stupid and you're uninteresting. I think the worst one in this set is um, it says she likes everyone but you. <laughs> it's my favorite. And when you do that, yes, the implicit system can get dragged in. Amygdala can't read, people. Okay? Amygdala can't read. This has to be another system coming in and dragging it in. It's very important. There's two routes to get 
an anxious response going. It could be bottom up, where amygdala has some basic crude information and it's intruding on the rest of the brain. And it could be top down. You could have cognitions that you're obsessing over and those can go down and grab this system. Once it gets going, it's going to be tough to tell them apart. But to try to separate those two roots would be important. This is a complicated story as to what happened in this study, but suffice to say, different parts of the amygdala did different things. Um, if I focus in on these three parts here, here's amygdala here, so you have an activation here medially, here dorsally, and here laterally. And the medial system was initially interested in everybody and then not so much. The dorsal system was only interested in the negative person and the positive person equally. And the lateral, ventral, went with negativity over positivity over neutrality. And the interesting thing about that activation is statistically this didn't habituate over acquisition. So I told you I can't tell you this is lateral nucleus. I can tell you it's the lateral ventral amygdala and that's, it maps to where lateral nucleus is. I can't tell you that these are Joe's storage cells that are holding on to the representation, but I can be informed by that science and wonder if we're, if we're not stumbling onto something that looks like that. Again, we have to be very careful with the spatial stories, but those are the data. And I can summarize the findings by saying we look like we're looking like we're getting more arousal type responses out of the dorsal and medial portion because they're equally interested in the positive and negative person. They're both important. But the lateral ventral is choosing negativity over positivity. Well, we've seen that before. I didn't show it to you, but in the surprise face studies, I, this is the one I pointed out to you. You find a lateral ventral activation that correlates, that's associated with you finding the face more negative. Okay, it looks very similar to this activation. And in that same study now, sometimes you think they're negative, sometimes you think they're positive. This is up only when they're negative. Whether they're positive or negative, these areas are up equally, homogeneously. That is, it's, whether it's positive or negative, it's still predicting something important that you have to figure out. And here's your dorsal information gathering system where basalis is. Okay? And we harp on these being able to tell these spatial differences because we've seen them before and we keep seeing them again in different uh, uh, experimental setups. I hope you've seen now that my uh, career has come full circle. I used to start it with tones and shocks and rabbits. And now this is a uniquely human social conditioning paradigm. There's my tone and there's my shock. And anytime you develop something that is only seen in a human for credibility, you have to take it back to the animal lab and, and make it work there, right? <laughs> All right. Hey, that could work. You don't know. That could work. Well, when we think about prefrontal, I have, uh, how much time do I have? Seven. Seven. Oh, I could do that. So, I'm finally conceding to really understand what amygdala is doing in the human brain. You have to at least know about this venture medial prefrontal circuit and Liz presented to you some beautiful data in paradigms that look a lot like Joe's paradigms and what we know about conditioning and extinction and reconsolidation and regulation. This is a really nice uh, anatomy paper in the monkey, if you haven't seen it. It's from Helen Barbas's lab from Boston University. Um, it's nice for, for 3,000 reason, re reasons. Uh, really nicely lays connections from amygdala to the medial prefrontal cortex and the, the return connections back. It validates something that Joe told us was true in the rat a long time ago. The projections coming out of amygdala the prefrontal are heavier than whatever projections you have coming back that might control that. That's how you're built. That's important to know. It tells you from the red areas where the heaviest projections are. Anatomists always think about heaviness of projections. That's where the action's going to be. So you would expect there to be an important dorsal medial com component and an important ventral medial component. And for, for Outcoming information, you would expect rostral cingulate and rostral medial prefrontal to be more important than it might be for stuff coming back. That's interesting. So my graduate student, Justin, um, assumed that these projections exist in humans. It's a good assumption. But that's what we do, right? Oh, we know amygdala is connected with prefrontal. Well, we know it in a non-human primate. Do we know it? So what Justin did, is he started with the fear, he started with what we know. It's always a good place to start. Take the fear faces, get amygdala activation, right? It's gonna work, 
because everybody sees it, but what he was interested in is something that we were all ignoring. These, these are error bars. There's variability here in the group that we're ignoring. And they're standard error bars, they're not standard deviation bars, so they make the data look tighter than they probably are. But so he, what he did is he replicated the response in our lab. Here's, the, here's the, the effect, here's the error bar. But if I show you the subjects, look at them. They're, they're very variable. So we, you, we take amygdala response to fear as a given. It's quite variable. Some people show you really strong responses and a couple of people don't. But they're all a little bit different. So now you have a regressor. Now you have a number you can use to see if you can find other places in the brain that that correlates with. Well, what Justin did is, what he does is he does something called DTI, which I'm sure many of you know about. Diffusion tensor imaging is a way to look at white matter tracts in the brain. And all he's doing here is taking a functional response in the amygdala and asking the analysis, go through the, the strength of all the white matter tracts you can find and tell me if any of them are correlated with this amygdala reactivity. Individual differences from person to person. And what he finds is a pathway that moves from amygdala through the ventral basal forebrain to, medial, to, to ventral medial prefrontal cortex. I'm showing it to you in coronals here. Here's the same pathway sagittally coming right down here to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. What he did then, so a pathway from amygdala to prefrontal, its strength in individuals is correlating with their amygdala responses. Now once you have the pathway, now you have these individual differences in the strength of the pathway, well, we ask our subjects lots of questions, but one we always ask them is we have them fill out a trade anxiety scale. How anxious are you in general on a daily basis? Some people are high, some people are medium, some people are low. This is all you and me, by the way. Normal fluctuations, You're not pathological. Well, you, okay? You have those differences in the, in the strength of the pathway and you have trade anxiety and what you find is a low strength in this pathway predicts high, more anxious individuals. And greater strength in this pathway uh, predicts um, lower trade anxiety. So if, you, if this thing, to the, the, the way the hardware is set up is predicting how anxious you're telling us you are, okay? Nice strong pathway you're telling us you're low anxious. And uh, so that's a pathway in a human. I just want to point out we weren't the first to show it, Helen Mayberg was, and we, with, with our data, are replicating the pathway she found, I think, quite nicely, and then taking it and showing it's predicting how trade anxious people are reporting that they're being. Well, if a static pathway is associated with anxiety, that makes some sense, right? Because anxiety is kind of free-floating. Free I can present stuff to you and see how much you react, but I don't need to do that with anxiousness. Anxiousness is anxiousness. It can exist on its own. So we have something in fMRI called resting state. That is, before I start showing you stuff, I can just measure what your brain's doing there spontaneously while you lie on your back. I can do it by grabbing an area of the brain that I care about, amygdala, looking at its spontaneous activity, which I've already talked to you about, and then saying, go across the whole brain and show me any areas of the brain that are correlating with what amygdala is doing. And what you find is that the ventral medial prefrontal cortex should be positively correlated with amygdala. They should be on the same page at rest. That's how I think about it. And the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex is negatively correlated. This is a study by Amy Roy at NYU. What we did is we thought, well, that's cool. Let's replicate that. We did. Getting a positive relationship in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and a negative relationship in the dorsal. And then ask, okay, take that correlation between amygdala and those, those brain areas across the whole brain and tell me any voxels that are correlating with how anxious people are telling you they are. You only find two areas in the brain that correlate where amygdala correlations with the brain predict your anxiety level at rest. And there they are. You have a ventral medial prefrontal area and a dorsal medial prefrontal area. This is with the correlation now. It's correlate, the correlation is correlating with anxiety. It would be ridiculous for me to try to explain that, so let me show you the data this way. This is how the, no, you should, how the normal brain should look, positive relationship with ventral prefrontal cortex. Let's break out the low anxious people. That's how they look. They look the way they're supposed to look. What, is the, what does the high anxious brain look like at rest? Well, the positive relationship reversed. You now have a negative relationship with prefrontal cortex at rest. You're not on the same page. Your baseline is somewhere else. And you have this negative relationship up here has broken down, okay? So the, you want to take resting state data if you're doing any task because this will, you'll, you're, you now know your, the prefrontal cortex is a different baseline. And you might be able to use these data to predict behavioral outcomes. So just to finish up, I just want to 
tell you why I've been making a case here for just using something as simple as facial expressions, because I believe they represent conditioned stimuli. To predict really important outcomes, I've told you about normal emotion, normal anxiety. Well, we can predict pathological anxiety. We can take people who are about to start an SSRI for their generalized anxiety disorder. Before they start it, show them fear faces in the scanner. See what amygdala prefrontal do to that. Let them go get treated by their doctor. We know one thing, two-thirds of them are going to get better. A third of them are not. We don't know who is who. They come back to us. Sure enough, two-thirds of them got better. A third of them did not. We go back to the data we collected before they started, what their brain was doing to fear faces. This is decrease in anxiety on the y-axis. Up here is an 18-point drop. That's a good thing. That means from time one to time two, their anxiousness dropped. These people got better. This is the same people. People who, before they started their drug, showed high prefrontal, low amygdala, did very well on the drug. But if you showed high amygdala, low prefrontal, you didn't. So those are the types of things, the reason we study this circuitry that you, we might be able to do with something as simple as, as passive viewing of faces. And so uh, I'll thank Justin and um, Caroline and Maytel, who are off on their postdocs. Um, this is my current lab here. And I'll thank you for your attention. Thanks.